Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. The today's date is August 23rd, 1999. Could you please state your name for the record? Walter J. Anderson, Jr. And your age? 80. And your current marital status? Married. Uh, what about any children? Two sons. Grandchildren? Two. Good, good. Great-grandchildren? No. Okay. Uh, and your address? Natick, Mass. Okay. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Milton, Mass., raised in, in North Quincy, Mass. Okay. And when did you move to North Quincy? Ah. Uh, oh. Well, when I was in grade school. What would you like to tell us about your childhood in North Quincy? Well, we lived near, not too far from Wollaston Beach. Could walk there, so I spent a lot of my off season from school down at the beach with the boys, and we used to play sandlot football and all that sort of thing. So I got interested in playing football. So that was my thing when I went to high school in North Quincy. That's about, about it, I guess. Good. Um, and then when did you move to Natick? Oh, that was, I met my wife in Natick. She's a, she's, <laughs> she was, but she was raised in Natick. And, uh, uh, of course, we got married when I was in the service, so she lived in Natick, and then when I got out of the service, we, we stayed right in Natick. Bought a summer cottage down here on the lake and made it into a home. What type of changes have you seen in the Natick community? Oh boy, <laughs> quite a bit. All this new construction here with the fire department and Police department, the library, quite a bit. Yeah. What was your family background like growing up in North Quincy? Uh, well, it was. I didn't. I'm. I'm the only child, so there was not much to talk about other children. But uh, we had a normal life. Father worked for for S. S. Pierce Company as a wholesale liquor salesman. My mother was a housewife, and uh, that was about it. Okay. When and where did you enter the military? I uh, entered the military on March 17th, 1941, in Boston, was inducted into, in, in Boston, and uh, that day left for Camp Edwards, where I received my basic training. Okay. An assignment. And how old were you at that time? I was 22 at the time. Okay. And w did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I was drafted. I got a lucky number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So March 17th, 1941, that's several months before Pearl Harbor. Oh, yeah. So we were still out of the war. Oh, yes. Uh, Those were the days when we were inducted for a year's service. And then we were supposed to be, and another group would come in. Well, it's a little story attached to that, too. Of course, the latter part of 1941, we went down to um, North and South Carolina for maneuvers. This was really the end of our, our training. And uh, we had gotten back. As a matter of fact, I walked into the barracks at Camp Edwards, put my helmet up on the shelf, and somebody turned the radio on, and lo and behold, Pearl Harbor was bombed. So we said, well, there goes our leave. Yeah. <laughs> How did you feel about the, the world situation before Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Did you think that war was imminent, that you would soon be fighting, or? Uh, I sort of suspected that uh, something was going to happen. Yeah. And, uh, but I really didn't think that's where it was going to all happen. I thought it would be more our friend Hitler. Yeah. You know. But, uh, yeah, it was, 
it was quite a quite a something to hear when you get back in the barracks and you say and of course I had oh the, the other thing that's really uh, uh, important at that time was I had 10 days leave coming to me and uh, we were getting married my wife and I were going to get married the first five days of that and uh, all of a sudden that happened of course and then I said Oh boy, so then they said, well, you're going to get five days leave, not ten days leave, right away. And they said, you can't leave the state. Yeah. I said, well, that, that kind of, <laughs> so we got married anyway. What was the feeling in the military immediately after the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Well, everybody was kind of shocked about it. And, uh, you know, disappointed that it had to happen. And you mentioned that you did your basic training at Camp Edwards. Yeah. Would you tell us about that and go through what what branch of the service were you in first? Yeah, I was uh, after uh, uh, going through the preliminaries. Uh, I was uh, assigned to the 101st Field Artillery Battery D. Okay. So I took all my basic with that uh, unit. Uh, then I was I went out to Oklahoma to Fort Sill for a while, and uh, had some um, officer training. And then I uh, I learned that my wife was going to have our first child. So well, I said I've had enough of this. So I transferred back to Camp Edwards, and. Uh, when I came back, I, because I had an accounting background, so I said, well, why can't I get in the finance department? So I did, I put an application in and, and I got transferred to finance at Camp Edwards. And uh, as time went along, someone one day mentioned the fact that I understand that First Service Command is is, uh, is looking for people to serve in the counterintelligence corps. Oh, I said. So I got a hold of an application, applied for that. Forgot about it for a while because I didn't hear for a long time. And all of a sudden, my commanding officer, Colonel in finance, got me in his office. He says. You've been transferred to Boston for a service command. You'll leave right away. And it was all like secretive, you know. And, uh, okay. <laughs> so off I went to first service command. And uh, that's when I got into the counterintelligence corps. Okay. And um, we took a lot of training there uh, in all kinds of investigative work and how to protect yourself. Uh, we, at one time we had a professional wrestler come and show us different holds to use if we got into close uh, uh, combat of any kind. Um, and that, and then we, then we were sent to, then I was sent to Kennedy's, you probably don't remember this, but there used to be a Kennedy's clothing store in downtown Boston. And I was to buy two suits of civilian clothing and all that goes with it. Because we, we, were, we were special agents at this point and, and we were to wear civilian clothes. Okay. So then part of the training, they would send us out on uh, investigations, people being cleared for secret information and so forth in Washington and things like that. So I got it all around Boston. I was spent a lot of time over Harvard University investigating people and getting a background on them. So that was kind of interesting. So could you explain to us what, before you went into counterintelligence and when you first began, what that entailed, what as a counterintelligence 
person you would be doing? I know you mentioned the background checks, but what, what type of other things? Well, that was, that was uh, basically what it is, you know, investigative work of any kind, any assignment we got, and then writing up the reports, our reports. And of course, uh, eventually it led to when we went to Europe, uh, you were looking for Nazis and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, you know, it was pretty broad spectrum. Yeah. So, um, how was that when when you were still stateside here, trying to do background checks on people and things? How how did that strike you? Did you enjoy that? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I you know I I didn't have any trouble. But as an accountant, I always, I suppose that's why they took me in, because you always recognize detail, and mm -hmm. I, I had no trouble writing reports, so, it was, so I, I liked it, I liked the work. Yeah. So then that, that lasted for a while, and then, uh, let's see, probably late, 43 or spring of 43, I got transferred to Camp Hollywood in Baltimore. And we were doing a little bit of cadre work within our own organization, the counterintelligence. They were setting up schools for further training in the field and so forth so that we would we would act as transporting some of the students who were agents too down to a place in southern Maryland where they would get sent out into the woods and see if they got lost <laughs> something and you know and survive survival is what it was yeah. and that was kind of nice for a while and that's where I left to go overseas from there so Okay, we'll get to, to the, your duties in Europe in a second. I'd like to find out your basic soldiering skills were taught at basic training at Camp Edwards. Yes, artillery. Okay, yeah. and where is Camp Edwards located at? That's down, down in Falmouth on the Cape. Okay. Yeah, Camp Edwards, yeah. And then this seems like it's more of a, an elite type of thing, this counterintelligence, and what other types of training did you receive? Was it a more intensive type of training, or was it more how to look for details, how to root out people well, for, for background first checks? First, of course, you learn how to, the factors of learning to, how investigations take place, what information you had to, to have to make a complete report. And um, there were certain factors subject matter that you had to deal with in, in your report, so they taught you how to do that. The art of survival mm -hmm. um, in all fashions, facets of it, uh, along those lines, okay. that's what it was, yeah. So take us now from Maryland and your trip to Europe, how you got there, um, what what your mindset was on the trip over, and and what the world situation was at that time? How were we doing in the war? Well, we, at that point, uh, I later found out we weren't doing that good as far as uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean was concerned. The Germans' submarine uh, uh, group were really devastating our shipping and troop transportation. But we left um, probably the spring of um, May, early spring of 94. Okay. 44? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I left on, uh, fortunately I guess I got a brand new troop ship. It was uh, General Billy Mitchell, named after General Billy, Billy Mitchell. And uh, we left. And when we get out in the uh, the ocean, uh, uh, did, when I woke, finally woke up and get out on deck and I'm looking around, my God, I never saw such a, a matter of American ships in my life. And uh, partway over, 
we had a scare, apparently, because the destroyers, a couple of destroyers came, one on one side of us and one on the other side were dropping depth bombs, because apparently this, the place was loaded with submarines. But we finally made it over to, uh, I landed in the Firth of Clyde in Scotland. And then from there they transferred us up to Wales for, for assignment. We stayed up there for a while, just sort of waiting for our assignments. And uh, I used to make trips to London to pick up supplies or stuff like that, just to kill time, I guess. And then finally they, they assigned us, they, not all of us, but myself and a couple of others were assigned to the uh, attached uh, detachment to the 6th Armored Division, which was down southern England at the time in training for the invasion, mm -hmm. which we didn't know when it was at that time. And. Uh, so while there, they, uh, they gave us some further training in survival, such as street fighting, house-to-house -house combat. So they sent us to a school in London for a week. And that's when I got introduced to the uh, V-1 rocket. We stayed at the YMCA at a block away. One, one exploded and threw my buddy out of bed. Wow. <laughs> And those are devastating, and, and uh, they're intriguing. And things. We go out at night, and sure enough, uh, you, you could hear them. They had a, a motor, but when the motor quit, look out, because that's yeah. when it was coming down. So we, we got through the course all right. It took about a week. And my, my buddy sprained his ankle. Uh, these English don't fool. This was English school. They don't fool around. They taught us how to recognize mines and uh, throwing grenades from uh, second floor window through the first floor window. And these were real grenades. If you miss, you're in trouble. <laughs> so they, as I just tell you, they played for real. Yeah. And uh, so that was all right. So we got back to our unit, and uh, I guess it wasn't too long. And the first thing you know, we're all going towards the embark debarkation area and uh, that was that was uh, six days after the in invasion started we boarded for across to France and we get over there all right and uh, we uh, unloaded I had my own Jeep by this time and uh, drove that off and then we went off the beachhead to the right over to the Cherbourg Peninsula mm -hmm. to regroup and, and organize, uh, get everything set for when we were committed. And uh, about mid-July, uh, we got our orders that we were going to be committed to combat. And we took off. Uh, our goal was to First of all, we went through San Lo. They had just, the Americans had just broken through at San Lo, and that was a mess. We were, went through there shortly after that was taken. But apparently our goal was the harbor of Brest down the coastline. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started off then, and of course, this kind of fighting in, in the hedgerow country was very bad, very bad. It was like, several different fields, it was all cut up in these hedgerows you couldn't see. And uh, on our way down uh, to the coast, we, we, we stopped one night at, and, uh, and we were near the headquarters company of the 6th Armored Division. And uh, we, we had all got into this hedgerow and um, we dug our foxholes. Good thing we did, I guess. And then the jeeps were all around the area. And it was getting dusk. And we were around my jeep, and we were just chatting. And uh, the first thing, boom! 
<laughs> and looked down, a bullet went right through a water can right by my leg. Mm. So, so we all scattered for our foxholes in a hurry. And uh, I got into mine, I had company, I had a mouse, <laughs> kept me company all night long. <laughs> and um, by morning, well of course, uh, uh, they, the, the armor went out and they, they quelled that attack very quickly, so mm -hmm. didn't get any further than that, with us anyway. So the next morning we took off again, down the, as I say, down the coastline. And uh, we got to a town by the name of Avaranches from France. And things were kind of mucky that day and that night. And uh, that was the next day. The captain of our group was, he, um, he said, he, no, he wanted to send us, a couple of us, a friend of mine and myself in my Jeep, and he wanted to know what was going on in a certain town down the way, and he wanted us to contact the mayor and find out basically where the Germans were. So we, we took off in my Jeep. And of course, we're in Patton's Third Army now. So you don't have any protection at all. No windshield, windshield down, nothing up on top, you're wide open. And that was his law, if you were in my army. Okay, so, so we, get, we, get, we get down all of a sudden, heading towards uh, this town, we, we, uh, we spotted a, a uh, line of our tanks. And I said, whoa. And we get up to the lead tank and, and uh, up pops the turret. And who was it but a brigadier general? And so I said, General, I said, what's up ahead? He says, hell, I don't know. We're going to attack. We're waiting for orders to attack. And I looked at my friend and me. Here we are sitting in an open jeep. I said, what do we do now? He said, well, we got orders to go down to that town. I said, OK. So I floored the jeep. I figured that was the only way. If I got going fast enough, they might miss if there was anybody looking for us. So we get into the town. I'm uh, nice and quiet. So we did find the mayor, went over and asked him what was going on, where the Germans were, if he knew anything about it. And he, he said, they're just leaving town, the other end of town. I said, oh, that's nice. <laughs> so then we, we got back all right on that little deal. So down we go, keep going towards Brest. And uh, partway, partway down the coast, we, uh, we get stalled for a week. And it, it, we, we weren't going anywhere. Couldn't go in, no orders, nothing. Uh, what's going on? Of course, that was when the Red Ball Express, you know, with Patton was going so fast, he was out running the gasoline supply. And I, I'm glad the Germans didn't know that. But anyway, we were stalled for a week. We couldn't move, no gas. Could you explain what the Red Ball Express was? Yes, Red Ball Express, they, they were lugging gas to the armored divisions. You know, two and a half tons loaded with nothing but gas cans. Yeah, that's the only way. We were going so fast at that point. And, um, and, and then we were stopped, and finally it came down that we can't move. We're waiting for gasoline trucks to come in, you know. So we finally got gas off, we go again. Then we got very close to the outer areas of the harbor of Brest. And that was when I saw my first uh, U.S. bomber shot out of the sky. It wasn't very pleasant. And uh, so we holed up outside there for a while, and they were entrenched. The Germans were, it was well fortified. And that's why they were bringing in bombers and everything. We were having an, uh, the whole group, armor, infantry, were having an awful time trying to get in there. So one day a captain said, well, he says, by this time I had my Jeep, they put a submachine gun mounted on the passenger side. And I, 
I was a one arm, a, a one man army at that time. I, I had a dozen hand grenades under my seat of the Jeep driver's seat, and I had uh, a uh, Detective 38 Special under my combat jacket and a shoulder holster, sidearm, 45 pistol strapped on, a carbine, 30 caliber carbine, a submachine gun. And I said, my God, I could start my own war. <laughs> uh, so all of a sudden they, they said, well, there's rumor, the, the captain says there's a rumor coming that there's a German uh, outfit trying to sneak out the road towards this way. And he says, I want you fellows to go out there and, and see if you can, uh, you know, take care of it. Oh, nice. So my, my, I was the lead, the only one who had a machine gun on my Jeep. So, of course, in, in our group, there was, only have to realize, was only about, oh, probably 10 or so of us, 12, small group. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I get up on the road and I parked the Jeep and uh, needless to say, quite nervous. And I said, what am I gonna do? I found a wide open Jeep. I said, if they come down this road, sure, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna pick them off as many as I can with a machine gun, but you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna make it. So thank God. Um, it never happened. It never happened, so we went back. But that was another scary moment. So that was all right. Then, um, then I was transferred out of the division to 12th Army Group, which was Gen General Bradley's group, Omar Bradley. And uh, he When we got back there, they, they were making up what they called a task force and made up of a lot of different units, and one of them was a counterintelligence unit. So I went with them, and we headed up towards Belgium, Liège, the Malmody uh, area, and uh, we, we stayed there for a while and, and, and trained and uh, just sort of waiting for some sort of an assignment. And that's where I ran into in Liège, Belgium. Went there one day and, and uh, we were investigating some buildings back there and that's when the V-2 rockets started to come in. And uh, I got introduced to one of those, a block away one hit. Those were terrible. You couldn't hear them. All you heard was, that's it. So that was all right, we'll get out of that. But uh, then, uh, as you know, then the Germans uh, started the Battle of the Bulge. So Bastogne, Melody, we were up in that area. How we come to be there, I don't know. but. Uh, one night the uh, captain said to us, uh, he said, we got orders to go to Luxembourg, which was 12th Army Group headquarters at the time. And our assignment was to guide the American generals, Bradley, Patton, all of the generals who were meeting there for uh, the rumor had gotten around that they wanted to assassinate the American generals. So we were sent down as like Secret Service people, put up in Luxembourg, and then we would pick them up from the hotel and bring them to the quarters and then escort them back. So that was all right, but I had, I had a sort of a funny experience that, that time too. I was in back of the uh, hotel that they were staying, the generals were staying at, and they had this overhang so I could get my Jeep parked underneath. And I was not aware of it, but there was, out in the parking lot in the back, there was a, a, a military trailer there. So lo and behold, while I was waiting for my 
uh, pick up uh, who comes down but General Patton, all dressed up with his guns and everything, and his dog Willie. So he, went, he took Willie over to the trailer, opened the door, and he wanted Willie to go in the trailer. Willie didn't want to go in the trailer. So he says, Willie, get in the trailer. Uh, Willie, get in that trailer. And of course, you know what happened next. <laughs> get in that damn trailer. And he finally got the dog in the trailer. Well, I had all I could do from <laughs> laughing myself silly, but I, I did, he didn't know I was there. And then he went back in, and I shoot, I got out of that one, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of uh, took care of that. That was good duty. And then we, um, we started to get deeper into Germany and everything, and, uh, and then we were assigned to, we were sent to Koblenz, right on the Rhine River. No, first of all, we went to Cologne. We went to Cologne. We stayed there for a little bit. And had the U.S. Army crossed the Rhine River at this point? Or? No. Okay. No. I suppose that's why we were around that area. Uh, Koblenz wasn't too far from the bridge at the time, but we went to Cologne first, stayed there for a while, and boy, was that town devastated. Uh, our bomb was just flattened there, all except the cathedral there. That was the only thing standing. So, and then you could walk down to the Rhine River, and the Germans were right across the way in the Rhine River, so you never exposed yourself uh, walking down there. So then they transferred us to Koblenz, which was south of that, near Remagen. And, uh, we had a nice setup going for us there. We, somebody had uh, got a uh, three-story house for us, and we had a, we we were eating ten and one rations in, at the time, and we got a hold of a, a French chef who served the troops in World War One. Wow! If you believe that, and he was a great guy. And he would take those 10 to 1 rations. He'd make a meal out of those, and I don't know how he did it. But that was great. And, uh, and at this time, we even had uh, German civilians working for us to keep the jeeps washed up and so forth. And uh, we, we hired some uh, German help or French help, whoever happened to be handy. And. Uh, we had, uh, then that's, uh, then if that lasted for a while. Then the captain uh, asked me, uh, at this time he, he wanted to give me a direct commission, and I said, uh, I said, how long do we have to, uh, how long do I have to serve? Because I had a lot of time in already. And mm -hmm. of course the point system, I, in my unit, I would have been the first to leave. So I said, he says, two years. I says, forget it, Cap. I said, I got a wife and a child at home. Yeah. I said, uh, I've about headed up to here. So, okay. He was a nice guy. So anyway, then we got transferred to uh, further into Germany. We were in uh, this state park kind of thing. We were in the ranger's house. And, uh, well, this, we were just doing practically nothing and waiting, waiting for our next assignment or what was going to happen. And finally, of course, the war ended over there. And then now, what, what, nobody knew what was going to happen now. So finally, one day, as I, as I anticipated, they came down and said, Anderson, you're going home. Oh, good. <laughs> so the orders came down, and I took off for Paris, or they, where our headquarters was in Paris. Stayed there for about three days, and then we weren't sure. We had the rumors started to go that we were going to transfer us to Japan. And I, said, Gee, I don't want any part of that if I can avoid it. Well, then they changed their minds. They said, "You guys are going home." Okay. So that's about 
Good. Yes, sir. Good. Taking us through the whole yeah. war in Europe. That's yeah. good. Um, I just want to backtrack and some things that, that I didn't want to interrupt you on, but I'd like to know about. Um, I kind of get a sense, but how did you feel about General Patton? He was a true soldier. And truly, if, they, if in some respects, if they had let him loose, he, he would have got into Berlin before anybody. Yeah. But politics came into play between the Russians, the Americans, the British, and they wouldn't let him. They wouldn't let him. He was kind of baloney about that. But yeah, he, he, he was a, he knew his, his armor. Uh, he knew how to handle me and he, he raced down the, uh, down the coastline there. And towards the end, uh, I was out one day, another fellow and I, we were going along the road, and I saw this big contingent of prisoners coming down the road, being marched down the road towards a camp, prisoners camp, and uh, I just had to look them over, and it was really shocking because they had old men they had almost young boys in, a, in, in uniform. Mm -hmm. I said, isn't this sad, you know? Terrible. So when you saw that, it was pretty obvious that oh, they were on knew, their last leg. You leg. know, this isn't a <clears throat> long yeah. war. Yeah. So. Um, now back to your time in the 6th Armored Division. As a counterintelligence specialist, what, was, what were your duties in this type of uh, unit? Well, occasionally we'd, we'd get a, uh, a rumor of, uh, of, uh, of a Nazi and we'd, we'd go and uh, try to see what we investigate, see whether it was true and what have you. And this happened in Koblenz. I was sent out on an assignment uh, towards, well, it was towards Remagen, a little town before then. And we had a room where there was some Nazi down there, and they had him in the, in the jail. So we went down. I took a a, a German linguist with me. We we had them with us in our group. And I get down in in the uh, police station, and we uh, investigated. I started to talk to uh, the wife, I guess. She was the one that made the allegation. So, okay, I wasn't satisfied that I was getting the information I wanted. So I, I said, do you have any children? Yes. She had one 10 years old. I said, may I talk with him, please? So he came in. <laughs> children, you know, tell the truth. So sure enough, it was a family squabble. There was no Nancy and Wild involved at all. It was a, so I said, so that's the end of this. So the wife was trying to get back at the husband. Yeah, and it was a f domestic problem, but the, the boy told me the truth. I surmised something was not right. <laughs> so as you went through France and into, and you went through Belgium and Luxembourg and into Germany, what about the civilians that you saw? The French civilians first, were they happy to see you? Their living conditions, and could you comment on that? The, the living conditions uh, were not good. Food was, was, you know, not plentiful. Uh, I can tell you a funny incident that took place in France. We, of course, in the field weren't getting much in the way of uh, great meals. So, and uh, eggs, you know, were nothing but powdered eggs or whatever, and um, so one day, I, I was out on the patrol for something or other. Not patrol, but I was investigating, uh, looking around the neighborhood, and I got an idea, you know. I said, eggs, this is farm country. <laughs> so I had a couple of, uh, they called them charms. They were really hard candy, little, little ones wrapped up. And I had a oh, maybe a couple of dozen of those in my pocket. And I says, well, I wonder if I can make a trade here. So 
the kids came out, of course, chocolate and all this, you know. So I said, no, no, I am getting chocolate. But then I said, eggs, eggs, eggs. Yeah, so I got it across to them that you bring me an egg and I'll give you a piece of candy. You'll make a trade. Well, I'll tell you, the eggs were coming from <laughs> everywhere. And I ran out of candy. And I said, no, that's it. That's the deal. I had a whole helmet full. So we went back and we had nice <laughs> eggs for breakfast <laughs> deal. So that was kind of, but no, then when we got to uh, Belgium, we were actually in Belgium, we were billeted with a, with a family. They, it wasn't too good, but they, they had some uh, rooms that they were renting out to the army. And a fellow from Texas and myself, we got a room. And we used to, they would invite us over to have coffee with them or something. It wasn't real coffee. And uh, they didn't have much at all, but they were offering us their food. And I said, no, 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 no. So then we started to dig for a little rations here and there. We would bring them some coffee and so on. So they but they treated us very nice, very nice. Everybody was very nice, except when we got back to Paris on the way home. Then they wanted to fleece us. Yeah. <laughs> a couple, of, eight of us went. Imagine that eight of us went to a nightclub called the Bell Tavern nightclub. It was a famous one in Paris, and we sat down. And of course, it was a floor show, and. and, and and we had the girl come over. So we, we're like, a, uh, how much is the wine? Eight dollars a bottle. We all looked at one another. Okay, we'll take one bottle. <laughs> so yeah, eight of us, we had one bottle. We got the floor show. It was a nice floor show too. But that was it. Imagine that. Yeah. Eight dollars a bottle of wine. So and what I'm, about any other R and R that you might have had and and things like that in Paris or anywhere else? I, I, I unit, uh, we were pretty much busy all the time and we actually didn't have any R&R, &R. you know, like going to uh, a certain area mm -hmm. for shows and everything. We never saw them, but we were only a small group, so yeah. we, uh, we did our thing and that was that. But it, was, it wasn't bad, it was good duty, so I, so know. now you mentioned um, a few days after D-Day, you were in the French countryside fighting in the hedgerow type fighting and the bullet yeah. whizzed by you. Was that your first time under fire? Yes. How did you react to that? What were your immediate thoughts and feelings? Well, it, it, the first reaction is surprise and whoops, you know, protect yourself. So we all dove for our holes. And, uh, but, you know, you, you get you get so that you know you're in, in, in harm's way, or you could be any, at any particular moment. So you get used to it after a while. And, uh, oh, I, yeah, the only other thing is in the Battle of the Balls, I, I got a uh, frostbitten toe out of that deal. Oh, that was a cold winter. Oh. And of course, in an open Jeep, you have no protection from the weather. So. I used to put on every bit of clothing I could find. <laughs> Overcoat. God, if, if I had to move fast, I couldn't move <laughs> out of my own way, and I still cold. How was the the equipment that you had? Your clothing, weapons, and things ah, like that. The combat boats, as so called, were terrible, and they knew it. They were trying to correct that. They had a smooth leather lining, and a rough leather outside. Cold would go right through that like you had nothing on, and that's where I get. The frostbitten toe. Could I take a break? Sure, sure. Can we stop it for a second? Yeah. Break. Okay. And uh, we'd like to get a little bit of background on the experiences that you've had. So if you could take us through the situation at the Battle of the Bulge. Well, okay. okay the um, it was real nasty, and uh, the the climate, of course at that moment was, was in their favor. You, you, we couldn't use any of the air power we had, and we, we dominated the air at that time, but nobody was flying. And of course, that made their movements, they could move almost like undercover. Mm -hmm. Couldn't see anything, fog, snow, 
ice, whatever. And so the th things were tough. And uh, and we we were we were weak in that area, and they knew it. Uh, matter of fact, they had uh, an infantry division. I think it was a hundred and sixth. Infantry Division had never really seen much combat, and they were in the line, so-called line, mm -hmm. type of war that you never know where the line is. One time I found myself behind the line, didn't know it until we, we <laughs> found a, an aid station, our own aid station, and, and these were guys who were wounded, all, all kinds of wounds waiting to be transported back. And I said to the lieutenant who was with me, I said, uh, you know, Lieutenant, I said, I don't think we should be here. Somehow or other, I think the Germans are just up ahead a little bit. So he says, maybe you're right. He was looking for it. Yeah. Um, so my, my understanding is that we, that the U.S. military thought at that time, December of 44, that the German army was basically on its last leg and couldn't mount an offensive. Yeah. And yeah. we were surprised our troops were undermanned and uh, was that the sense that you got yeah the, the sense the sense was that here again some politics were in play between Eisenhower and his his staff uh, Mountbatten and and his staff and everybody had their own idea what was going going to happen of where it was where it was going to happen on it, it turned out uh, we went right, and uh, so we were weak in that area. We had unseasoned troops, and it was just, and the Germans knew it, and they just, they wanted to get to Antwerp to take where they could get the, uh, the uh, harbor there, and uh, which was where I left from to come home. Um, and boy, they had their equipment was excellent. They had they had some superior tanks to ours. Firepower was excellent. So they really uh, they really were throwing all their eggs in one basket. They knew this was it. And, and they came close. And they they came close. The only thing is that one as soon as the the uh, weather cleared, we had superiority in the air and we had superior movement of equipment mm -hmm. in other words we, we had plenty of equipment it was just the idea we had to get it up in there from down south you know yeah the line extended all the way down to Luxembourg and and that that went to Bavaria uh, so the stuff came out up like you wouldn't believe I, I, I was, of course, I was headed to Luxembourg when this stuff, and I said, my God. I said, I hope the air power, the Germans don't have any planes up there. They'll make mincemeat out of this yeah. bunch. But, and it was rolling, rolling, rolling. I knew where they were going, and uh, so that was nice. Now, you mentioned that they had superior tanks. I'd like you to comment on a comparison of our materials, our weapons, against the Germans. Well, in, in, in a lot of other uh, cases, uh, we, had, we had more of it, and our equipment was good. But in tanks, they seemed, they seemed to be one step ahead of us. We, we were gaining on, on them. Stuff, new stuff was coming over, and, and much better compared to what they had, the Tiger tanks. Mm -hmm and that 88 uh, uh, gun that they had on the tanks, that was murderous. Uh, uh, but we had, we had the, the ability to move and move a lot of equipment mm -hmm. fast. Of course, when we first got there, you know, they were still lugging around um, artillery stuff with horses. Yeah. Would you believe that? Yeah. Unbelievable. Now, what about the, the German soldiers that you fought against? How did you feel about them as, as adversaries? 
I think in many, of course, you had the diehards like you have in, in, in you know, those who, who were indoctrinated with the Nazism. You couldn't talk to those people, but there were a lot of civilian soldiers that were conscripted mm -hmm. into the service. And these people were ordinary, everyday citizens. And those who I talked to, you know, they didn't like what was going on at all. Yeah. If they did talk to you, because so you know they, they weren't the diehard Nazis. No, mostly no. The diehards, they were miserable. But yeah. Um, as you know. How did you feel about uh, your allies that you were fighting with, the British in particular, as, as allies, as soldiers? Um, did you have close contacts with them? I, I bumped into them once up around, I guess, Aachen up that way, Liege up that way. I guess we, we bumped into them, and we were coming into this town, I guess they were in town, either leaving or, and we, we met some, they were good soldiers. No, no, I, don't, I wouldn't uh, downgrade the English soldier. Yeah. No, no, they were very fine. And <laughs> I used to get a kick out of their humor, you know, talking to them, it just <laughs> yeah, they were a good bunch. I guess it was a uh, armored unit that we, we met in there. And uh, I don't know where they were headed for. Matter of fact, I'm not sure where we were headed for. <laughs> uh, it, 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 things were so fluid at times. You know, you would just travel, travel, travel. And of course, the thing in the Army you had to be afraid of is they didn't surround you, you know, because you just keep poking ahead, poking ahead. Yeah. And, uh, but I would say, Patton deserves all the credit that they give him. As a general, as, as a person, I don't know him that well. And uh, he was fiery, there's no question about that. But he looked, he looked every bit a soldier. Yeah. So now, underneath the generals like Patton and Omar Bradley, what did you think of the leadership that you had while you were in Europe? Th th they were good for the most part. They were good. I mean, you, you, everybody's going to not be right all the time. Mm -hmm. How can you? You've got a fluid situation going here all the time. And sometimes you don't know what's happening on the other side of the line. Who's where and what's where. And yeah. But by and large, the intelligence was, was very good. Slipped up once in a while, but that happens. What would you say your greatest challenges were while you were in combat, while you were in Europe? Well, I suppose the big word is survival. That's the biggest challenge. Yeah. <laughs> to stay alive if you could. Uh, because half the time, uh, you know, the, it's not like World War I. The trenches are here, you know? And the Germans are over there, the other side. They got trenches. This was a large territory. Everybody's all over the place, you know? So uh, you had to establish lines and they want, it, it's not that kind of trench warfare, it's yeah. just tree to tree and all that sort of stuff. You go through the forest and everything. Uh, it was nasty though, it was nasty. The devastation, I never saw anything. The thing that always troubled me, that when I get back here and, and um, got into civilian life again, the thing that always upsets me is, you know, you Americans take everything for granted in life, in day-to-day -day life. But good God, those people had nothing. Their, their, their houses were demolished, the towns were demolished. There was nothing left but rubble. Yeah. And I said, you people don't know that. You know, they were hungry, they didn't have anything. But, you know, they, 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 they survived, yeah. for the most part. What about any, any friendships that you made during your time in the service? Well, it was only a small group of us. Most of us, uh, oh, I only had one fellow that uh, 
was w with me towards the end. He lived out in Ohio. And uh, we, we were bunk buddies uh, uh, up until I left. And we used to send Christmas cards to each other and a, a letter once in a while. And that went on for about 10 years. Then, of course, you drift apart. Yeah. He couldn't get time to come visit. I said, come visit. Nice guy. And, and I never could get out to Ohio, so that sort of drifted away. But n no, you see, as a group of, say, 10, 10 or 12 people, and this is the way we were all during the war, and then, then every time you got transferred to a different assignment, you'd probably meet new, new buddies mm -hmm. to work with. So we never developed any c close association with, yeah. with anybody. The uh, last guy I had was uh, uh, was from Texas. He was a he was a character, and uh, <laughs> and we were in uh, um, Bavaria at this time, as I said, at that uh, that state uh, forester's house, and uh, where our headquarters was for the twelve of us, and. Uh, <laughs> He, uh, he said, well, one day, just, just a funny incident, he said one day, he, he, he got sent from home a bottle of Southern Comfort. And he said, okay, he says, the first guy to go home, he says, I'm, I'm going to crack the bottle. So that was all right. So we all forgot about that. So I was the first one to go. Sure enough, he kept his foot, he cracked the bottle, and when I left, I didn't feel any pain at all. <laughs> Yeah, he was a nice guy. So now, during your service over there, you you have this new bride that you've been married to yeah. for a short yeah. time. Y your first child is born. Tell us about your, your family life during that time and how you stayed in contact and what your feelings were there. Well, I always say my wife was the one, was the one that got wounded. She did all the suffering. Okay, she lived in a very small, to me, it was an oversized garage. Wasn't properly insulated. And uh, my son caught asthma during that winter. And uh, she just survived. <laughs> and I got a funny, one day, uh, my allotment hadn't arrived home, I guess. By this time, I had reached uh, tech sergeant was my uh, rating, and uh, so she said, "Well, we need money for food or something." No, no. The the fellow was after the rent. She was renting this little shack, and uh, in those days, I guess the rule was that you couldn't throw a veteran's wife out unless she didn't pay the rent. So she said, I better get down to the bank. So she had a large $50 down at the bank. And the rent wasn't much. I think it would, was it, uh, I don't know, $15 a month or something. It wasn't worth any, anything anyway. So I always claimed that she was the one that suffered the most. Would you correspond through letters and? Oh, yeah. But you, you may always, you know, it took you a dog's age to get a letter, of course. Because you're in, you know, you're moving in the field all the time. As I say, I didn't, we didn't have much time to stop and enjoy life. Yeah. Uh, you got to keep moving. In our particular assignment, uh, we had a job to do, and, and we tried to do as best we could with what we had. But uh, it's not, the work was good. I, I enjoyed every bit of it. Yeah. You know, I was. Very glad, in a way, because when I when I saw, uh, you know, seeing your buddies on the field, the infantry. We, 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 as I say, sometimes I got farther beyond the line than I I knew, and you'd see your own land there. They hadn't even been picked up yet. You know, it hurt. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you see a lot of that. I think in in all the time as well, we we only lost one of our own, and that was in in. Uh, uh, he was in a jeep accident. 
Because those things were dangerous. Oh, my buddy from Texas, he, he got a purple hat. <laughs> this was good. Yeah, we were on a, on a night uh, march, vehicle behind vehicle, and all you had was the blue lights. And to know it was where the vehicle was in front of you, but on both sides it was ditches, very narrow road. Well, somehow or other, he got off the road and his Jeep flipped. And he got a, I guess, a broken rib or a bruised rib. So they sent him back to the hospital and he, he come back. He, he didn't, he, he wasn't there long, he came back and he says, guess what? I said, what? He says, I got a pearl pot. I said, for what? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> uh, so that was a funny one. So now take us from, you were the first one discharged in your unit. Yes. And you said that you departed from Antwerp. Take us from the time you were discharged until stateside, if you would. Okay. We were on a Liberty ship and uh, of course then everything was nice. We had a, uh, I, I, because I was a senior non-commissioned officer, I, I had ten fellows I was responsible for on the way back in our organization. And uh, so halfway over, the, it, it was a good crossing, except there was high rollers, you know, and uh, of course the ship would motion, okay, lots of motion. So I'd, I'd be up in deck all the time because uh, I love boats anyway. And uh, one by one, I was losing them. I got seasick, and I'd have to get seasick pills and take them. I had one guy. He says, "I'm going to die." I said, "No, you're not." He says, "I will too." Oh no, this this guy. Yeah, he was sick from the time we left Antwerp. We ain't even out of the harbor yet. He went up the gangplank ahead of me. A Syrian guy, I think he was. And uh, he says, I'm going to be sick. I says, you're not even on the <laughs> boat yet. I'm going to be sick. Sure enough, he was the whole trip. And the minute he walked off the gangplank in New York, he was well. And that, of course, that's where everybody was well. I, I fortunately didn't get sick, thank goodness. I, I think one day I felt kind of miserable. But How long did it, it take? It passed. About three or four. Oh, about a week, mm -hmm. yeah. So we came, came back, and the uh, the joy of it was, and I had never seen it in my life, was they took us right by the Statue of Liberty. Well, I said, what, what a nice sight, you know. Made it all worthwhile. So then they took us to um, a harbor in, in, uh, in New York there, and with some off disembarked, and we went to what, what, Camp what, I don't know, in New York, New Jersey, I guess. And they processed it through. Then they, they ship, shipped me off to Fort Devens, because that was my nearest point to home. Mm -hmm. And then, that's where they discharged me from, is Fort Devens, in October of 95. I'm 45, 95, 45. And then, and then you got to see your wife and, and your child? Yeah. yeah. How, what were the feelings like there? Oh, he was, what, at this time, uh, three years old. Wow. And, you know, who's this guy yeah. walking in the house? Really, it, it, it was tough on him. And, and you know, he, the only thing he had was his mother. And uh, it was tough for a while, but he turned out to be quite a guy. So he lives up in Maine now, the oldest one, and then I had a younger one when six years later. <laughs> so how do you feel the community and the country treated the returning veterans from World War II? Well, I I I have no complaints. I, you know, we we got a state bonus from Massachusetts, I think it was $300. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but I had a relative in the family who didn't think they should give us veterans a bonus. So that was all right. So I didn't, you know, I said, for the, you know, 
I wonder if she was, uh, her husband made good money all during the war. He was not in the service. And my, uh, one of my w uh, wife's brothers, and the other one didn't get in the service either. He worked in a shipyard, so they were all making good money. And when I went in, it was $21 a month, believe it or not. So when I got a weekend to come home, to, uh, for a weekend pass from camp, it was to come home to my wife for a weekend. It, I blew everything just coming home one weekend, you know. <laughs> the train ride from camp, it was up to Boston. So, you know, and then uh, when I started to work my way up in the field artillery, I became a, uh, a uh, on the gun, I was a number one position. I pulled the lanyard on the 75 uh, guns when uh, they were all World War stuff mm -hmm. we were training on. Then we got the 105 howitzers, and the corporal was the, he, he sighted the gun and then uh, set the gun, and then I pulled the lanyard, fired the gun. So I was number one on the crew, and then there were about three or four others to handle the ammunition and stuff where we trained on that. So, that was, uh, no, you know, I, I perfectly have, then I finished my education. See, that was the other thing. I, um, I lived in North Quincy with Four River Shipyard, you know, of course, mm -hmm. that was all wall work, right? So, when my draft number came up, I, I appealed actually, I, and I wanted three months, I just give me three months, because I would have graduated from Bentley School of Accounting and Finance. All I was, I was working on, I had a course to take in income taxes, I think. And they said, no way. Well, okay, that's the way it is. <laughs> so it was, it was funny. Uh, went into Boston, and a fellow that used to be on the second team on the North Quincy High School football team, I, I was played left guard first team, and he backed me up. And would you know, I didn't know this, but on the ride down to Camp Edwards after both of us got inducted, I met him on the train. Would you believe it? We both went to uh, Camp Edwards together, and uh, sorry to say that later, he went to the infantry and I went to the artillery, and he was killed overseas. Yeah. Nice guy, hell of a nice guy. So after the war, did you take advantage of the GI Bill, the benefits from the GI Bill for housing or yeah, education? Yeah, of course, course I needed one course mm -hmm. to get my diploma. So yeah, I did, I used it for the one course. and graduated from Bentley School, which is now Bentley College. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. How important do you feel your service in the military was um, to your country and throughout your life? Did, you know, was it? Oh, I, I think military training didn't hit me one iota. Uh, of course, I was into athletics in high school anyway, so I knew what you know, what training was in, in that sense. But I wasn't trained to kill people. Um, I'll protect myself from being killed. But I, I, uh, I was very proud of it. No, I, I had no qualms about serving at all. The one thing I always thought, though, and has nothing to do with my serving, but it, it has to do with, you know, those days they could have had more women in the Army doing the clerical jobs, mm -hmm. you know? And they could have used a lot of that, the male help up further in the lines. You know, they, they, to me, they, they didn't take advantage yeah. of the female Smart, yeah, so to speak. You know, they were quite capable of doing a lot of things as we know today, yeah. right? Yep. Uh, what did you think then, and what do you think now regarding World War II and and how events played out, um, both in Europe and in the Pacific? 
I, I think basically they've um, they played out very well. My only thought at the time was, and I guess maybe I can see why Ike did this, but I always disagreed with him for not letting our troops take Berlin completely, freeze out Russia altogether. I don't know. I think they could see then that Russia was not going to be our best buddy in the world. Yeah. So I, I kind of, that kind of ticked me off a little bit. But I suppose in the long run, putting it all together in these late years, that maybe there was some wisdom in what he did. I don't know. So as a soldier in Germany in 1945, with the Russians as your allies, did you know, could you feel that at some point in the near future we wouldn't be allies anymore and we would probably be enemies? I think we, I think we as soldiers, a lot of, a lot of us had, had a sneaky feeling in the back of our heads that, you know, these people are after more yeah. than what they're talking about. Yeah. And as it turned out, they were. But so after your service, did you get involved in any veterans organizations? Yes, I, uh, I got involved in AMBETS here in Natick mm -hmm. and became their, matter of fact, I'm, I became their commander in, uh, back in 50, 51, I guess. So I'm the senior past commander now of this post right over here on the lake. Good. Yeah. yeah. How did you feel about uh, the difference in public opinion regarding veterans and the wars in World War II, Korea, and the Vietnam War? Well, let's take Korea first because that was ahead of Vietnam. Korea, I was invited to go back into the service with a direct commission. And I had my two boys, and one was just a young fellow, and I, I was building a house down here in the lake, and you know, I said, thank you, but no. All I had to do was go to Murphy General Hospital for a physical, and I was in. And I said, I don't know, I don't feel lucky about the second time yeah. around. Okay, so I turned it down. Uh, Vietnam, I think it was a mistake. I think it was terrible that we got into that mess. Darn shame, really. Yeah. And I don't think that those veterans really, you know, it was terrible. I think they could have been treated a lot better. The people just, you know, almost let them down. Yeah. And that's not right. They served the country, as, and, and so do the Korean veterans. Served the country as well as anybody else. Yeah. Uh, is there one thought or memory that you'd like to share with any family members or historians or researchers that could be watching this tape in the future? Just that I was lucky to, to make it and happy to be back and alive and talking at this point yeah. in my life. Well, we're grateful to have you here, and we thank you, Mr. Anderson, for your time and your service thank to you. the country. Right.